previously on Going Solo. Hey there, Jim here, going solo. Welcome to the season finale. As you probably figured out by the episode title, Song Idea 186 actually has a name. And while the vlog will continue on after this project, this is the final episode covering the production of the new single, Above the Rain. After this video, it's ready for release and distribution. So I'm gonna get right to it. We took a bunch of different sounds and gave them a spot to sit and work together as a unit in a space. You can close your eyes and envision this sound actually happening in a room or a club or an arena, etc. It's been mixed. Now it's very important to make sure that this mix is ready to sound good on a wide variety of sound systems and not just one. And it also needs to be ready to be duplicated on whatever medium that it's being produced for. That is the purpose of mastering. Here is the most simplified way of explaining why things get mastered or why you need to master things. If I adjust my song, so that it has a lot of bass coming out of a laptop or a cell phone speaker, two things that are known for crappy bass response, well, somebody's gonna end up popping that song into their home theater or their car with a subwoofer and blow their windows out. If I'm making a vinyl record and leave too much bass in the song, or I have too much stereo bass where bass is coming out of one speaker more than the other, the needle can actually jump out of the groove constantly and the record won't play correctly. This mastering process involves taking this new audio clip and making subtle adjustments on the song as a whole. I can't adjust individual things anymore because it's just one stereo recording now. If something isn't right with an individual instrument or element in this mix, I've got to go back to the mix and fix it at that stage and then come back to this. I work through this process very quickly using my ears, my gut, and the reference songs. Listen. Decide what it needs. Tweak it. Compare it to the reference song a bunch of times. Did it really improve or is it just the placebo effect? Is my brain thinking it improved just because I did something? Make that decision, yes or no, and then move on to the next step. And then I have to prepare it for the release medium, which for me is digital, so there aren't too many special things I have to do for you to get an enjoyable listening experience from that. Let's master this song. So here's the final mix loaded up in the mastering session. It is ready to put the gift wrap on this present. This is the final treatment. Uh, it's getting it ready for the final medium that it's going to be on and it is making sure that it sounds the best on all systems possible. So just for a refresher, here is what the final mix sounded like. Another day, another phone will ring, say they can't hold on. And all those years I've done nothing to ease the sting, said I can't go. It sounds pretty good as is, but it's about to sound a lot better. And one of the most important things is references. So out of the three reference tracks I was using for the mix, I pulled the one that I thought the song sounded the most like, and I've pulled it into this mastering project. Another thing to notice is the look of the waveforms. This is only a mix. It's not very loud yet. And you can see these peaks of the waveforms are not very big yet. Now, if you compare that to the commercially released song, this baby is at the limit. That is limited, it's compressed, it is very loud. Now, loudness is not a goal of mastering, uh, but these days, songs need to be loud. If you want attention and if you want to be able to compete, your songs need to be as loud as who else you're on the streaming service with or who else you're on the radio with. So we're about to fix all that very soon. So of the few but very important effects that are being applied here, the first one is match equalizer. So I used this on the drums in the mix. I didn't show that, but I did use it and I'm going to use it here. So this is a very special equalizer that has the capability of analyzing your own track and then you can tell it a reference to look at and it will analyze it as well. So that's my master or my mix. And that's the reference song. That's what their equalization curves look like. They look pretty similar, but there are differences. And then it'll tell you the difference. So this basically is saying, this is the, this is the center line 
right here. So anything above is turning it up. Anything below is turning it down or cutting it. This is how close I got to my reference track. Uh, that frequency needed to be higher. This frequency needed to be lower. That one higher. This is very close. Now, a lot of the professionals would say that this is cheating and that you should just take this as a guide and make your own adjustments. Well, I have news for all those people. I have a full-time job. This is a hobby for me. I used this EQ curve. Sue me. So here's what this sounds like. Another day, another phone will ring. Say they can't hold on. And then without. And all those years I've done nothing to ease the sting. Sounds a little bit more harsh, doesn't it? Go Back on. Okay, the next thing that I did, I did listen to that quite a few times, and there were a couple of little changes that that match equalizer made that I did not agree with. So I turned on a little graphic equalizer, and this frequency range right here, around 7,000 hertz, I nicknamed that the pain frequency. It's low treble. Too much of that can get really uncomfortable in your ears pretty quickly. A really harsh symbol, or uh, your S's uh, when you're talking, those are in that range where they can get irritating to your ears. I cut that just a little bit. And then I added some very high treble frequencies up here for some sparkle and some shimmer. And that's sometimes nicknamed the expensive area because a lot of your commercially released music sounds very shimmery and expensive. So I'll start the track without that and then I'll turn that on so you can hear the difference. Another day, another phone will ring. Say they can't hold on. And then turned on. And all those years have done I got a little shimmer out of it. Back off. And back on. Apologies for the computer stuttering around there. When, you, when you're turning these effects on and off live, it kind of jumbles with the audio as it's trying to figure out what's going on and also trying to play the song at the same time. So, without both of those effects, once again... And then with both of them. And all those years done nothing to ease the sting. Said I can't go on. Okay, the next thing was a very, very subtle compressor. And this is not really making a super audible difference, but it's definitely working behind the scenes a little bit to just help further glue it down. This is like a decibel of difference. It's, it's knocking loud stuff down by one decibel, which is just a drop in the bucket. But that can make all the difference in the world sometimes if you do that a couple of times through the whole process. Another day, another phone will ring. Say they can't hold on. And all those years I've done nothing to ease the sting. Said I can't. Okay, and then one more compressor. This is a multi-band compressor, which this could be an entire episode by itself, so I'm not really gonna go into how these work, but basically this breaks the frequency spectrum down into four different chunks. You have deep bass, mid bass, all the mid range, and then the high stuff, the treble. And it breaks those frequencies down and separately and compresses each one of them separately for an even more precise effect. I, I found that this really helped the low bass and the high treble. It gave it even a little bit more shimmer and a little bit more thump in the bottom end. Another day, another phone will ring. Say they can't hold on. Both of those compressors off. And all those years I've done nothing to ease the sting. Said I can't go on. Both of them back on. Both of those very subtle differences, but it's very, very important to be subtle in the mastering process. You're not trying to make huge changes. If you need a big, huge change, you got something wrong in the mix. You need to go back and work on that some more. Now, the only big change that really happens is one of my favorite ones, and that's the final step, the limiter. This device is going to be the one that takes the waveform from looking like that to looking like that. Now, bear in mind, the output decibel level is not going to change but you're going to swear it's getting louder. 
Well, that's because it is. The loud things are staying the same. The quiet things are becoming louder and louder, making the entire recording sound more full and present. And here we go. Another day, another phone will ring. Say they can't hold on. And all those years I've done nothing to ease the sting. Said I can't go. If you heard this song on the radio, which do you think would sound better? Would you pay more attention if it sounded like this? Another day, another phone will ring. Say they can't hold on. Or this. And all those years I've done nothing to ease the sting. Said I can't go on. So there you have it. There is the final master. That is what the song will sound like when it's released. And just one more time, for the heck of it, here's what it sounded like just in the bare mix. Another day, another phone will ring. Say they can't hold on. And I'll turn all the effects on one by one to go back to the final master. And there's the final master. Now for just a visual comparison, since the master is actually already done, I'm going to grab this song's final master and place it on this track right here beside the reference. And there's what they both look like. Well, the track is all finished. It's ready for release. Now it needs some artwork and I'm going to be doing that too. So time for a little photo shopping. Well, same old story, right? A hundred different fonts on the computer and 95 of them look totally goofy. But hey, we, we found one that works. So speaking of Photoshop, uh, this is not Adobe Photoshop. I do not wish to pay for Adobe Photoshop. This is Corel Paint Shop Pro. Uh, Photoshop, much like Kleenex, is one particular company's trademark that has just become a blanket term for everything. Uh, I've been using Paint Shop Pro since about 1994 and have been using pretty much every version between then and now. Absolutely love it. You, you can deal with layers, get all kinds of effects going in here. Now I went all out for the Trailing Edges album cover and used multiple layers and all kinds of effects, but I was lucky enough to take this picture with my phone and I thought it looked so nice that it just needed some minimal treatment, maybe just some text and no other effects. So we'll get the text on there with a little line in the middle and I thought I would maybe do a reflection of the text in the water and I did that by hand. Not too bad. Maybe some 3D drop shadow on that text. I am by no means any sort of graphic designer or graphic artist, but I've always had a lot of fun manipulating things with this program. The blur on the drop shadow is looking pretty good there. There's a lot of parallels between the music and this. Really, you're dealing with layers. You're dealing with just adding the right amount of things to bring out the best in everything. Now, this does have to be a square. That's the only other thing left. Uh, whether you're doing a CD or you're uploading to the internet, uh, the album art needs to be a perfect square, whatever dimensions it ends up being. Armed with a complete song and artwork, now what? Well, there are companies out there called aggregators. They will accept your uploaded song and artwork, or your album if you've made a full album, and they'll distribute them to services like Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music, YouTube Music, etc. They will even collect all of the royalties from the streaming and the downloads and pay them to you. And if you've ever read credits or liner notes on any commercially released music and you've seen the acronyms BMI or ASCAP, those are two of the major performing rights organizations. Any song of somebody's that's performed in public or on the radio or TV requires royalties to be paid to the creator of that song. Those organizations handle the payments between the venue or the TV or radio station and the creator. I'm a BMI songwriter, so if anybody, for whatever reason, decides to perform any of my stuff, I'll get a little something something. So let's set this bad boy up for release.
my distributor or aggregator of choice is a company called CD Baby. They're not paying me to say that. I just haven't had a reason to go anywhere else yet. That doesn't mean that they won't give me a reason someday, though. The submission process is pretty straightforward. You enter the performer name, the name of the release. You put some genres in there so it's categorized correctly. You'll answer some questions about the music. Who owns it? Who owns the copyright? Is it original? Is it public domain? Is it studio? Is it a live recording? Uh, next, you name a songwriter for royalty purposes. After that, you're given the choices as to which streaming and download services you want the music to be on and whether you want to opt in to all of the royalties if people use your music in videos that they make. After opting in for all that, the actual cover art and the song themselves are uploaded. And after paying one low sum of $29.99, the track will be inspected. And once approved, here is the scheduled release. Well, the champagne flute is buried in the back of the cabinet, but hey, I got the next best thing, right? Well, it's finished, and so am I. Almost six months start to finish on this project, starting with an idea and ending with a song. Vlogging every step of the way so you can see it. But the thing is, you really didn't see all of it. You know, the part of the song that this vlog focused on was only about 25 seconds. This song is four minutes and 59 seconds long. I listened to it on anything imaginable to try to make sure it's what I wanted. I listened to the final product on this. I listened to it on this. I listened to it on these. I listened to it on this. I listened to it in the car. I listened to it on these. And it is exactly what I wanted you to hear. It is ready for release on December 22nd. And there's a special surprise for release day too. But don't worry, there's gonna be plenty of social media posts about that this week. Until then, have a very Merry Christmas. Have a Happy New Year. Just have a great holiday week. I'm going to go relax because I'm exhausted. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next year on Going Solo. Guitar!